Hello, everyone. Uh, today, our speaker is uh, Andrea Sanna from uh, Cagliari University, if I pronounce it correctly. And, <laughs> and he will give us a talk on equating millisecond X-ray pulsars, observational properties. So we listen to you, Andrea. OK, thanks. Well, I have a technical problem. I do have a message saying there is, there is recording, but I can get rid of that. So I'm trying. <laughs> to figure out how to do that. Just one sec. Okay, I think I leave. Okay, I'm going back to full mode now. Okay, well, first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And it's always nice, you know, to have the possibility to share uh, my work and my interest in, in science with other people that are doing similar things or actually not. So um, this talk uh, is, it's meant to show you, well, give you some overview of uh, a, 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 an interesting class of object that is called accretive millisecond X3 pulsars. And I'll try to focus mostly on observational a, uh, aspects. And I'll try to well, show you how interesting these systems can be and what we can learn and what we know at the moment. Here I have a list of collaborators, well, actually the, mm, many others that I forgot to put here, but, but this is the main group that I collaborate with. And uh, uh, to start with, let me give you some overview of, um, of where this system collocate in terms of astronomy. Well, basically I focused on uh, binary systems uh, uh, named low mass X-ray binaries. So we have an old, a late type um, star that have mass lower than one solar masses that is orbiting around a compact object that can be a neutron star, a black hole, or a white dwarf. In my specific case, as you will see, uh, I'm more interested in system that have a neutron star as a compact object. And here you have a uh, zoom in is an artistic impression, of course, but it's a zoom in on what we think is happening close to the neutron star. And we have matter that is transferred from the companion star, so the late, the, the late type star, and uh, because of high angular momentum, cannot directly accrete on the surface of the neutron star, and therefore it starts orbiting, creating a structure called uh, accretion disk, and at some point, uh, viscosity in accretion disk will allow angular momentum to be transferred and matter can closely cl get closer and closer to the neutron star. The interesting part of having a neutron star, which is highly magnetized, is the fact that at some point, as we'll see later, the pressure of the magnetic field will stop ma the matter from the accretion disk. And then some interaction will allow you to have part of the matter accreting on the uh, magnetic poles of this system. But I'm, I'm spoiling a bit the subject. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you later more things. I'll, um, let me first uh, uh, emphasize the, the fact that we are dealing with binary system where one of the object is a neutron star. The fact that we have a neutron star make this system overall more interesting because we are dealing with very compact object. We have uh, uh, basically a sphere that has the radius of the order of 10 kilometers <clears throat> in which you can compress matter of the order of, let's say 1.4 solar masses. Here I'm giving a range between 0.5 and two solar masses, but basically 1.4 is the, is the value that we usually say. What does it mean this? It means that the, the system is extremely compact with uh, some different stratifications of the density uh, uh, as a function of the distance. But the nice part is that we reach, uh, uh, we have regions where the density is so high that we actually at the moment don't know exactly what's going on. So the density has, such that we cannot recreate it in laboratories. And therefore we don't, we don't know exactly which kind of, what is the state of the matter there. And this of course gives rooms uh, to theoreticians to you know, predict the type of matter, the state of the matter that can uh, uh, habit this, this, this region here, but we'll still 
leave us with a doubt because it's, it's difficult to recreate this situation. So uh, um, the other uh, uh, nice thing of neutron star is that they seem to show magnetic field that can go in a very large range going from 10 to the seven up to 10 to the 15 Gauss, meaning that the magnetic field is extremely strong and therefore interaction with matter, which is basically plasma, is going to be affected by this uh, magnet, magnetic field. So adding all these things together, we have the perfect laboratory where we can you know, investigate several aspects of fundamental physics. As I mentioned, we don't know exactly what's going on in the center, um, some layers of the neutron star, and therefore we would like to try to get and fair uh, um, what's going on there. As I mentioned, theoreticians have, pre have some prediction of the kind of matter, the state of the matter that can uh, habit these, uh, these systems. And they make some prediction on uh, pressures and density properties of the matter that can be translated in uh, macroscopic properties such as mass and radius. And what you see here is what they usually in jargon they are called uh, equation of state. And uh, in terms of, so uh, uh, observationally speaking, the fact that we have some sort of relation between mass and radius will give you the opportunity to try with with direct or uh, uh, non-direct uh, methods to infer observationally mass and radius. If we manage to do that, we can then try to go back and derive what is the pressure and density relation and therefore try to guess what's the state of the matter. Uh, not only mass and radius are important, also spin is important. As you can see here, the green region uh, in the bottom part is actually telling us that if we know the rotation of the neutron star, that's one thing that I didn't mention, but this system seems to rotate very fast. At the moment, the fastest one spins basically more than 700 times per second. So the fact that we know the rotation, how fast they are spinning, actually give us some information on the type of matter and try to, uh, can exclude some of the equation of state. So, Knowing these observational properties, mass, radius, uh, uh, magnetic field, and spin can actually allow us to infer more properties of the neutron star. Uh, here I'm uh, mentioning a list of, uh, uh, let's say, type of measurements for uh, mass and radius that in X-ray astronomy has been used and they are still used uh, uh, to try to infer those to, those properties. I'm not going to go in detail in each of them. I will actually more focus on accreting the second pulsar. I'll, I'll briefly show something about the spectral uh, part, but this just to give you an overview on the fact that X-ray is, is crucial uh, uh, to try to understand properties of neutron stars. Uh, let me show you a quick movie uh, that uh, can give us some explanation on the critical millisecond X-ray pulsar. As you can see here, before starting, we have latex type stars, so the companion star that lose matter through the, what it is called uh, roche lobe overflow. Matter flows from the Lagrange, internal Lagrangian point, then has angular momentum, it star orbiting around the neutron star, which is the object here. I don't know whether you see my arrow, my pointer here, but if you see it, I'm pointing now at the neutron star. You, here you have the, this accretion disk uh, system that is creating because of conservation of angular momentum and then viscosity within the accretion disk allow matter to get rid of angular momentum moving forward, the angular momentum and the, the matter can put the move inward and get closer and closer and closer. So I start the movie now and this, there will be a zoom in on the region close to the neutron star. And as you can notice here, uh, as we get closer and closer and closer, we will see that at some point the matter reach a region where the magnetic field is strong enough to put pressure and to equilibrate, to, to uh, yeah, get exactly the same force as the run pressure of the matter that is accreting. Now, in this configuration, the neutron star has basically a dipolar uh, shape for the magnetic field. And the nice part is that matter 
from the disk can actually get anchored in the line of the magnetic field and matter can reach the surface of the neutron star, specifically the poles, the magnetic poles. When the matter reaches the surface of the neutron star, that part gets brighter, gets brighter with respect to the surface of the neutron star. And therefore, since the object is rotating, every time the brighter spot points toward our, uh, our line, line of sight, we will get more photon. And this creates what is called pulsar effect. One thing that probably you notice here, let's see if I can go back quickly, is that the neutron star, when accretes matter, it starts rotating faster. That's because the angular momentum left on the matter that is accreting is actually accreted and in, in, incorporated by the neutron star that will start accelerating. And then I, I will show you later this, and that's something that we can actually measure when things are happening. So when matter is accreting on the neutron star, sometimes we are able to see the frequency of the neutron star increasing, so rotating faster. Now, uh, this summarizes what I mentioned. So at some point, the run pressure that is proportional to the amount of matter that is accreting, so m dot, will be balanced by the magnetic pressure, which is basically proportional to the square root of the mag magnetic field. This happen at uh, what is called magnetospheric radius, that has that kind of dependence there from the physical parameter. And we say that we have the accretion condition when the mag magnetic spheric radius is smaller than the corrotation radius. When the corrotation radius is basically the radius in the disk where matter orbits at the same frequency of the neutron star. So, Let's think it uh, in this way. If matter rotates faster than the neutron star, basically you start pushing matter away, so there is no way you, you can accrete. Having said that, this is the list of known accreting milliseconds so far. This collection of sources started in 1998 with the discovery of Sachs J1808, and basically we started discovering this system when we had the possibility to have detectors capable and sensitive enough to collect enough photons to detect these signals. So Rossi X-ray timer, time explorer was the first one that allowed to do that. Since then, basically what, uh, yeah, 20 more years, uh, we managed to collect uh, 23 systems. The last one, very recent, probably you heard it, if you read the uh, astronomical telegrams, has been discovered a couple, uh, uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, among the, the systems, uh, you will see three of them that are uh, re reported in, in red. Those are called transitional millisecond X-ray pulsar. It will be clear in a moment why those three systems are peculiar with respect to, to the others. In general, we call accreting millisecond X-ray pulsar pulsars that show, show shown in, in X-rays, let's say that have a um, spin period larger than 100 Hertz. So they need to rotate at least 100 times per second to be classified or higher to be classified as a critical second X-ray pulse. Why are those systems so important? Well, they are important because they seem to be the link between another class of object that we know, so millisecond pulsar, the classical, let's say, pulsar that we know in, uh, in uh, radio and uh, low mass uh, X-ray binaries. To try to understand this link, we use this plot that is called P dot P diagram. Basically, P dot is telling you how quickly is the period of, the, of a neutron star changing in time, and P is the period, how quickly is the system rotating. Now, what we know is that when a neutron star is generated, basically, okay, sorry, I don't see the pointer anymore, but basically uh, um, when you generate a, new, a neutron star, the system will have a very high magnetic field and is rotating rapidly, rapidly. So if you go in this plot, you will have, you will be more or less on the order of millisecond uh, spin period and derivative of the order of 10 to the minus 12, minus 13 
second per second. What happened during time? Well, when you generate a Newton star and it is rotating, the large magnetic field is such that when you rotate, you lose energy, basically because of Larmor's formula. The energy that you are releasing is basically the uh, rotational energy, meaning that after a while, the system will slow down because it's losing energy. So in this plot, after that you generate, it's, it's, a, it's really a pity I cannot uh, use a pointer here, but anyway. So basically you are in the middle of this, of this plot and when you, when you lose uh, rotation energy, you start moving on the left side. So larger and larger or, uh, or, uh, orbital uh, spin period. At some point, you don't have enough energy to be released and then you don't show radio pulsation anymore. So you end up in what is called graveyard line. Graveyard meaning that you are dead in, dead in terms of radio signals. One interesting thing is that this is what should happen on neutron star, isolated neutron stars. But then at some point populating this plot, this, this graph, it appear a bunch of systems in the region, in the yellow region here. All those are systems emitting in, emitting in radio that have a peculiar uh, properties. They are very fast rotating, very low mag magnetic field, and very low um, spin derivative. How is that possible? If you go in the graveyard and you lose energy, there is no way you can, let's say, speed up. So one of the hypotheses is that probably those systems during their life, they've been part of a binary system where actually matter from the companion has been transferred, angular momentum from this matter transfer reached the neutron star, accelerate, spin up the neutron star, and then you can you know, gain velocity, so increase your uh, rotation frequency again. So this hypothesis called recycling scenario has been there, let's say, since the probably the 90s. And then the first accretive millisecond X-ray pulsar in X-rays has been observed at the end of the 90s, let's say confirming some sort of a link. So if I can observe a rad an X-ray pulsar, actually I'm probably seeing the phase where matter is accreting so when the, the standard neutron star is spinning up. Very recently, actually in 2013, for the first time, it's been observed a system that when accretes, when matter is accreting, emits as an X-ray pulsar, but then when matter is not accreting anymore, it switch off in X-rays and switch on in uh, radio. So basically we have the missing link saying, okay, those systems that we see as a millisecond pulsars in radio, they are spinning very fast, are actually underwent actually mass transfer and they spin up. So we had be the beautiful confirmation of this scenario that has been around for several years. And this is basically the, those are the three sources that I that I, I uh, that I reported in red in the in uh, in the other slides, and basically, actually, only one of them, EGR J eighteen twenty four five, showed a full uh, transition between standard uh, uh, X ray pulsar, accretive second X X ray pulsar, and radio pulsar. For the other two, we have strong uh, evidence that actually they do that. But there is, a, there is a, 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 one main difference in the fact that they, they don't seem to show a standard outburst, uh, but they show, they show what they are called a subluminal state. Those are details, it's not really important. The important thing is that those are clearly the missing links between radio millisecond pulsar and X-ray millisecond pulsar. Having said that, I'll give you uh, briefly some idea what we know about the X-ray spectrum. Basically, a, a system with neutron stars and accretion disk, uh, in those systems, we can align three main sources of X-rays. 
First one being the, the surface of the neutron star. We can model it, uh, model it basically as a black body uh, temperature a bit higher than one uh, uh, kilo electron volt. Then we have the disk. The disk uh, is not a really black body, is what it is called a multicolor disk black body because basically is the superposition of the black bodies a slightly different temperature that change when you get closer to the neutron star. So if you get closer to the neutron star, the, 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 the temperature of the black body starts to increase. If you do the, the superposition of all these rings at different temperature is basically a modification of a black body. Zero order is a black body a slightly lower temperature than the neutron star surface. And then we have another uh, uh, region that is called Corona. We don't know exactly the shape, but the main result is that is responsible for uh, the emission of photon at much higher uh, energies than expected from the disk and the neutron star. This system, we can get up, uh, photons up to hundreds of uh, uh, kilo electron volt. And the main reason seems to be related to the fact that the corona can be seen as a cloud of all electrons uh, uh, that actually interact with the photons coming from the uh, disk and the neutron star. And they, they undergo, uh, they, they basically have Compton interactions. And what happens is, is that they gain every time they, they, they collide with these, uh, with, uh, hot, these hot electrons, they actually gain energy and they end up creating a power law like uh, spectrum that goes to high energy. So they, this is basically what we know. Uh, in general, we can identify two different states. One is called soft state, the other one is called R state. The main difference is that in the soft state, it looks like the disk can get closer to the compact uh, uh, object. Therefore, the soft part dominates with respect to the R one. Uh, while in the R state, basically we have uh, the disk truncated far away and then a corona that is filling the gap and we have more uh, hard photons with, with, with respect to soft photons. In the case of a crypto millisecond pulsar, basically we have, I will say 90% of the time that we observe those systems, those are in the R state. There are a few exceptions, but basically all of them are in, uh, in the R state. There is one extra uh, feature in the, in the energy spectrum uh, that is quite important in terms of uh, investigating those systems. Which is, a call, which is called reflection spectrum. The basic idea is that once we have photons generating the corona, photons will be diffused in the, uh, in the whole uh, space. But of course, a fraction of them can actually interact, go back interacting on the, on the matter in the accretion disk. And basically what happens is that a composition, a superposition of effects, fluorescence, absorption, uh, uh, recombination and so on and so forth, we create this spectrum that is basically a continuum plus feature uh, from which the more uh, uh, intense one, the, the, the more important one is what is called the area line um, uh, component, let's say. The interesting part is not only the fact that you have an, an area line uh, generated there, but actually it's the shape of this line you need to keep in mind that this emission is happening in a region, the accretion disk, that is basically rings of plasma orbiting very close to the neutron star. And therefore, you will have different effects playing at the same time. Uh, now here, there is a summary on the left side. You have a summary of all the effects that create this peculiar shape. And basically the three main effects that we can uh, uh, highlight are the standard Newtonian effect, Doppler effect, due to the fact that we have matter in a ring that moves with respect to the line of sign. And therefore we will have components. So uh, approaching or uh, um, uh, well, going the, the, uh, far away from us, and this will create shift on the energy of the frequency the, the, of the line that we see. So standard Doppler effect. Combined with the fact that matter close to the neutron star can actually reach fraction of, uh, of the speed light, you have to include special relativity effects such as transfer Doppler shift uh, and so on and so forth. 
And then you have to keep in mind that you are very close uh, to the neutron star where the, where the gravitational field is very strong such that the well, the gravitational well will, will tend to attract photons uh, and in order to escape, let's say they, they, they have some, well, they have to, let's say, lose, uh, give some energy back to escape. And this will create what is called uh, gravitational uh, redshift. Now, if you combine and you integrate the effect of this um, process on, all, on each single ring of the disk and you make, let's say, the total profile, you will end up with a, this asymmetric broad profile that is characteristic from, compact ob from system having a compact object. And the nice thing is that if you, if you investigate, so if you model these lines, you can end up having information about the position in this where the line is generated. So you start getting upper limits, for example, on the sides of the compact object saying that, okay, if the disc reaches the surface, I know that more or less this is an upper limit on the size of the, for example, on the neutron star. Here is, is an example of uh, an iron line profile observed in, in, the, in the first accretive millisecond X-ray pulsar that I discussed earlier, SACS J1808. And you see here, those are the residuals uh, uh, from the spectral fit. And you see that clearly you have a residual that it looks like a broad emission line in the range, in the, in the energy range of, of the iron. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the case for all the accretive millisecond X-ray pulsar. This is a collection of accretive millisecond X-ray pulsar where there is no hint of, uh, uh, of iron line. And this is actually an interesting aspect. It's probably telling us that the state at which we observe the system plus uh, uh, the, the properties, probably the uh, uh, ionization of the disk and some other things uh, do not seem to favor for the old class of accretive millisecond X-ray pulsar, strong emission, uh, uh, iron line emissions. This is one uh, thing that we are currently investigating. Uh, let me uh, quickly uh, go up, uh, so switch from uh, X-ray properties, so spectral properties to timing properties, so temporal properties. As you know, most likely you know, uh, low max X-ray binaries in general and a pretty millisecond X-ray pulsar as part of being low max X-ray binaries are transient uh, um, systems, meaning that they show X-rays uh, for, a, for a relatively small amount of time we compare with the life of the system. So we have what they are called outward faces where X-ray luminosity can get uh, in the range between 10 to 36, 10 to 38 uh, uh, per second. And those periods are uh, usually lasting between weeks and months, more weeks than months usually, with a few exception, of course. At the end of these outbar phases, the system goes in what is called quiescence phase. So X-ray luminosity is still there, but it's very, it's very dim of the order of 10 to 32, 10 to 34 like per second. And usually the idea is that you have some, uh, so this is coming from the cooling, from the cooling of the surface of the, of the neutron star. And this part is quite interesting if you want to infer properties of the neutron star, because by modeling uh, the emission, the, the, the quiescence uh, 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 emission from the neutron star, you can start try to get the, the, the radius of the neutron star if you model it as a black ball. So apart from this large variability on, off in, uh, in X-rays, we, uh, uh, we have plenty of rapid variability shown in this system, starting from coherent pulsations, uh, what, they, what they are called burst oscillation. I'm pretty sure you are uh, already about type one bars. I'm not covering that part, but given the background uh, of some of the, of the people there, I'm pretty sure you've heard about burst oscillations and, type one bars. And then we have a periodic variability that can be at high frequency or low frequency. So we have a lot of things in principle we can discuss. I will focus only on uh, uh, coherent variability. So uh, coherent pulsations, meaning try to detect a signal that is telling us how quickly is rotating the neutron star. 
Uh, how do we do that? Basically, we start with standard Fourier analysis. So we make a Fourier transform, we, we take the, the coefficients and we create what is called a power density spectra. We usually normalize that for commodity using the Li normalization, and then we end up with something similar. So here is the case of two power spectra of two newly discovered accreting millisecond X-ray pulsar. So let's assume you have no idea about the source. For the first time, you, so you see it in X-rays in the sky. You, you take observation with instruments that have enough time resolution to cover, let's say, frequencies of the order of thousands of Hertz. You, you take a, power, uh, a Fourier transform, you create a power spectrum, and then you end up with something similar. Sometimes what happens is that on top of what is called white noise, that is basically in this normalization, a constant uh, uh, close to a factor of two, you have large spikes. These large spikes that I'm zooming in there are actually signal coherent, quasi-coherent quasi signals that are telling us how quickly is rotating the neutron star. In this specific case, since we still, well, at the moment we have still no idea there is a, there is a, a neutron star in a, uh, in, in, in a binary system, although we have a good guess because, I mean, it's emitting an X-ray, so matter needs to be transferred. In this specific case, the, uh, the horn, the double peak shape of the, uh, of the power spectrum is actually telling us that there is Doppler modulation. So this is an int that actually, meanwhile, the neutron star is emitting, is actually rotating uh, uh, on a common center of mass in, in, a, in a binary system. Okay. Uh, besides Fourier analysis, we apply also another technique that is called epoch folding. The basic idea, the basic concept is that if you know that your signal has a variability, if you, if you uh, take chunks of your data at the same time scales of this variability, you can fold them all together in order to increase the statistics of your signal that is varying, basically mediating the non-periodic uh, uh, signal. So this is a nice way to put, to emphasize uh, a periodicity. If you guess the periodicity, so in this specific case, we have a light curve with a 16.6 days uh, uh, this, this period. If I, if I uh, cut the, this light curve on periods that are, for example, of the order of 60 days, as you can see uh, in, the, in the top right part, I end up with a profile of the variability. If I don't guess the variability right, right as in the, in, in, the, in the bottom case, Basically, I'm washing out all the variability, so I don't get anything. So it's a way to emphasize, to highlight one variability if you know some of these properties. Once you have uh, pulse profiles, which is what you get when you, when you, when you uh, use epoch folding, you can actually take advantage of the phase of this signal. Basically, if you have a sinusoidal function, you know that basically the properties are the period of, uh, of, the, uh, of the oscillation, the amplitude of the oscillation, and also the phase of the signal. So you, you, you take a reference uh, term and you see that sometimes if the signal changes, basically the, the, the phase will move with time. Well, what we see in this system is that if you have a phase that is changing with time, basically it's telling you that the frequency of the signal changes with time. You, you, you can see that in the last uh, e e equations. If you, if you write the phase with the letter phi, you can decompose uh, a, a, as a polynomial function how the phase will change in time. As you will see in a quadratic way, the phase will reflect variation of the spin uh, frequency. So basically, if we investigate the phase of the X-ray pulsations, and we have the possibility to monitor this with time, if the frequency is changing, we will have a quadratic behavior of the phase. That's usually what we look for to see if the frequency is changing with time. Of course, things are, can get a bit more complicated. We are still dealing with a binary system. So not only frequency can change because, you know, the, the neutron star is accelerating. But also we need to keep in mind 
that while the signal is emitting, the neutron star is moving in a binary system. So we need to correct for Doppler effects, basically. So delays on the arrival times of these photons. And uh, in order to do that, we use standard uh, techniques for binary uh, modeling of the systems. Basically, all these things, all the systems are relatively old, so we don't have uh, usually uh, eccentricity. So circular orbits are very, very good approximation for this. Um, so once we know all this stuff, we end up, for example, creating pulse profiles. Now, in general, well, so we have for a critical second X-ray pulse, we have different uh, uh, shapes for for pulse profiles. There are systems that are well described by a standard sinusoidal function. So a sinusoidal uh, model will be perfect. But as you can see from the other examples, for example, on the left and on the bot on the top right, some other systems are a bit more complicated. So the pulse profile are, uh, let's say, rich in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, harmonic uh, components, meaning that we have a fundamental component that will oscillate at the frequency of the neutron star. But then we have twice components at twice this frequency three times this, this, this frequency, so on and so forth, that most likely are describing uh, um, uh, richness in the process generating the, uh, the pulse profile. Okay. Let me go back to this concept that I tried to explain earlier on and you saw in the movie. So if you have matter accreting on the surface of the neutron star, at the, uh, at the radius at which you stop matter in the accretion disk, matter still has some angular momentum left. This angular momentum le left for conservation of angular momentum, once the matter gets on the surface of the neutron star, needs to be incorporated on the angular momentum of the neutron star. So in the standard scenario, this matter that accretes on the neutron star needs to increase the angular momentum of the neutron star and therefore needs to create a variation on the angular velocity of the neutron star. Therefore, we are predicting variation of the spin frequency because of matter accreting on the neutron star. So in the standard model, uh, the last uh, 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 equation summarizes that, saying that the, the spin of the, of the neutron star, so how the spin will change, will depend on the amount of matter you accrete, and of course, the angular, the, the magnetic moment of the neutron star, because it's telling you where to stop matter. So the farther you stop, the larger is the angular momentum left. So basically, from this theory, every time you create matter, you should see a spin, a spin up, so an increase of the frequency of the neutron star. Is that the case, observationally speaking? Well, we have systems that do that. As you, if you remember, I mentioned explicitly earlier that. If you monitor the phase, and that's what I'm plotting here on the, on the right side, if you monitor the phase, variation of the spin frequency will reflect on a quadratic behavior, increased variation of the pulse phase. And in this specific case, a parabola facing down is basically telling you that the neutron star is spinning. During the, the, the outburst of this source, IGR-291, uh, which is the fastest one spinning basically, uh, uh, almost 600 uh, times per, 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 per second, we managed to observe a spinning up of five times 10 to the minus 13 hertz per second. That's the rate at which he was increasing his frequency, his, uh, yeah, his rotation frequency. Is always the case? Well, not really. We have systems, as you can notice here, where actually the parabola is phasing up, not down. You can guess that phasing up, meaning that it, it means that the, the frequency is not increasing, but it's decreasing. So it's spinning down in jargon, let's say. But is that possible? I just explained you, I tried to explain you that if you accrete matter, you need to, you need to increase your rotation frequency because basically you are increasing the, the angular moment. Well, there is an explanation that is a bit more complicated than the one that I gave you that actually uh, uh, um, takes advantage of the idea of threaded disks. So the idea is that, as I show you, the, the neutron star has magnetic fields. So lines 
that are actually interacting with the disc, not only to stop the disc, but they can actually penetrate farther in the disc. And basically the, this interaction can actually drag down and slow down matter in the disc. Or basically what it is doing is, is dragging, is letting the disc drag down the neutron star and the superposition of these effects actually can have a final spin down uh, effect, spin down torque on the neutron star. And we applied this concept here for very recently for IGR J17591, uh, which was showing spinning down during the outparts. And we managed to model this with a, with, with a physical model that takes into account uh, this trading. And basically, uh, we managed to explain this with a magnetic field of the order of 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the 8 Gauss uh, in, uh, in the system. So we proved that actually you also have the possibility to spin down the system uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this, uh, in this um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, processes. I don't know how, uh, how if I'm getting very, very late. No, 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 Andrea, we have time, no problem. You can just go on. Okay, I'll, uh, yeah, I probably have at least 10 more minutes if you allow me, or whatever, if you get bored, just tell me stop here and okay. I'll stop. Just feel okay. free to continue. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, so I show you that uh, we, with the standard uh, uh, idea, we expect spin up. Sometimes you have spin up, you have spin down. Most of, uh, uh, of the time, things are much more messy. Here I'm showing you the case of Sachs J1808. The, the top panel you have flux as a, uh, as a function of time, showing you basically how the outbar is going. The middle panel is the phase. If you remember in the other case, it was much more clear that the phase was going, let's say, either up or down in a quadratic way. In this case, as you can see, it's very erratic. It goes there, it goes up, sometimes down, error bars are very large. If you see the third panel, so in 2002, basically it stays constant for a while and then it drops by a factor of 0.5. And then from there it goes uh, again, uh, varying. Well, this is an example of uh, a problem that we have in this system that is called uh, um, timing noise. So basically on top of a variation of the phase, we have some erratic motion uh, some random uh, variation that, well, we still don't know exactly what's going on there. We have some uh, ideas. For example, one being the fact that if you think the X-ray pulsation are coming because you have hot spots on the magnetic poles in a neutron star that is rotating, basically the idea is that if you have some wobbling of these spots on the surface of the neutron star, it can be that every time the neutral star rotates and it goes uh, uh, along the line of sight, the, this wobbling actually will give you the, the, the uh, feeling that the neutron star is going at different frequencies while it's only the region where you emit in the, the X-ray photons that is slightly moving there. So this is one of the options. Uh, there are other things involving the fact that you have two poles and basically the superposition of the signals coming from the two poles can give you a, co a coherent signal uh, uh, at, uh, at the rotation frequency, of course. And the idea is that if the intensity of these two poles varies with time, basically you can actually uh, jitter, create, create some jitter because of the different contribution. So there are several uh, uh, ideas around but the main point is that sometimes uh, uh, timing noise is a limitation on our study on the properties of the neutron star doing the output. Uh, let me show you some peculiar cases. I'll, I'll, I'll mention the fact that those systems are transient that basically the outburst goes from weeks to months. There is one case at the J19 Basically, that it went in outbars, I think it was in 2005, it stayed on for 11 straight years. 
pulsation was visible at the first few months and then nothing and then uh, sporadically sometimes you see the pulsation and then nothing for several years uh, there are some ideas of what would be going on there uh, it can be that actually uh, while you accrete matter on the surface you start varying the magnetic field so you decrease the magnetic field intensity and therefore matter is not stopped uh, uh, and can reach the surface of the neutron star it's easy to understand that if you reach the surface of the neutron star there is no channeling the lines of mag on the mag magnetic field and therefore there is no effect uh, there is no pulsar effect anymore uh, uh, there is another probably more extreme case which is aquila x1 basically aquila x1 is known since uh, probably 2000 something five probably uh, since then it goes in outbars every six months always like a clock every six months goes in outbars. well this is a light curve uh, of several years of uh, uh, of the outbars well pulsations has been observed in in a chunk only visible once in a 150 second time interval we compare of megaseconds of data we have so basically we treat this as an acute millisecond x-ray pulsar but of course we have doubts that only these 150 seconds well it can be something else going on another source uh, on visible only for a relatively small of time but that's an extreme case all the others are well behaving with, with respect to this. Uh, okay, there are other intermittent sources, but they, I mean, they usually uh, show much more pulsation than this one. I'll quickly go, so this is what's going on basically during the outburst. One other thing that we can try to investigate is what's going, in, what's going on on longer time scales. As I show you, those, things, those systems go in outburst and then in essence and if you if you remember the list of sources that i show you actually among them there are only few that has been observed multiple times some of them has been observed only once meaning that you know 10 years ago they were on and then since then nothing some of them such as sax j1808 they go in outbars more or less uh, um, uh, every two three years so for some of the system, we can compare properties on years, on baselines of years. Therefore, we can collect parameters, for example, frequency, orbital period, and so on and so forth, that can tell us the long-term evolution of the system. Uh, one thing, for example, interesting is that if you manage to monitor the frequency uh, after a long time of no accretion, you can try to understand whether during you no know, accretion the system actually behaved as a standard neutron star in quiescence so let's say some sort of uh, radio pulse why we go in this direction the reason is that when the system go in uh, in quiescence and we look in act in uh, in radio basically we don't see them pulse behave as a radio pulsar and I have an explanation for that, a possible explanation for that that I'll show you later. Uh, so if you if you use X-rays and you say, okay, that's the last frequency that I observed during the outburst, it goes in quiescence, it goes up again in outburst. What is the difference between these two frequencies? Well, if during quiescence it behaves as a radio pulsar, it needs to slow down. So it needs to spin down. If you observe this. So if you observe a difference in, in the frequency, you can use this number to infer the uh, magnetic field because how rapidly you spin down when you are a radio pulsar, it depends on the strength of the magnetic field. And here you have a summary of what we have in at least two sources. So we managed to significantly observe a spin down during quiescence and this put tight constraints on the neutron star uh, magnetic field. What about the orbital uh, period? Well, in principle, if you manage to observe the orbital period at different, time, at different times, and if you see a significant difference, you can tell, okay, the orbital period increased or decreased. Usually we don't have this sensitivity uh, in a critical millisecond X-ray pulsar. So 
all actually we have only one system and i i think i don't have time to show you but i recently published a paper it was an astro ph recently where we had the possibility to do direct so we have two measurements two out bars 10 years apart and we see significant difference in the orbital period in general for other system what you, you can use instead of the orbital period is what it is called uh, time of passage by the ascending node to make it very quickly and just to give you a, 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 an idea is basically some sort of phase orbital phase it's telling you not exactly how quickly you turn around but it's giving you some sort of middle way information it turns out that if you can plot and follow the time of ascending node you can actually well it is it's telling you how quickly the orbital period changes in a quadratic way so if you have a delay that is increasing in a quadratic way as shown in this figure it means that the orbital period is changing with time so you have a derivative of the orbital, of, of the orbital period here is the case of sax j1808 in basically uh, 20 years the orbital period increased at the speed of the order of 10 to the minus 12 second per second now do we expect this is something that is predicted or not well if you want to okay first uh, he, he, here is a summary of other measurements done for other sources basically what we have we have constraint so we have solid measurements for sax j1808 and for another source that is not in this list for the others we only have upper limits the reason why we have upper limits is that basically some of them only went in out bars like two or three times so the statistics is not enough to be precisely measuring this this quantity for sax j1808 we do and we can ask ourselves uh, is that what we predict? So if we take conservation of angular momentum, Kepler's third law, we keep in mind that we are losing matter. So matter is transferred from one side to the other. And we allow for possible losses of uh, angular momentum, for example, by emission of gravitational waves and so forth. We have theoretically speaking, a prediction on how the orbital period should vary as a function of time transferring matter from one side to the other. It turns out that for SAC J1808, if you do that, and if you assume that all matter transfer from the companion needs to accrete on the neutron star, well, it turns out that the orbital period derivative should be basically two order of magnitude smaller than the one that, you, that we observe. So we have observationally speaking evidences that tells us that the orbital period is expanding much faster than expected in sax j1808 but how is that possible is there a way to reconcile the fact that you are transferring matter and the orbital period is increasing too much with respect to the prediction well there is a way instead of transferring all the matter from the companion to the neutron star it might be the case that you are losing matter in the process so you are ejecting matter. If you eject matter, matter will carry not only the mass, but also the angular momentum of the system. Well, for sax j1808, it turns out that you can reconcile the orbital period expansion that we see, allowing matter to be ejected basically at the Lagrangian uh, uh, point during quiescence. This result seems a bit weird, but uh, if you see it in a different perspective, it can be explained with what is called the radio ejection hypothesis. The idea is the following. You have outward faces where matter is transfer, so the, the, the left side, where matter is transfer, it creates accretion disk, matter gets closer, incre uh, uh, there is accretion in the, in, uh, in the surface, and so on and so forth. Now we know that outbars actually at the end will uh, will uh, will stop and we have ideas of instability that can actually uh, um, empty the disk and so on and so forth so when you go in uh, so the this model is telling you now if you go in a quiescence we know that those systems are basically neutron star rotating so if there is no more accretion they should behave at ra as radio pulsar now a radio pulsar is basically emitting radio waves. Radio waves at ascent and power 
can actually interact with matter far away. So the idea is that you can have pressure from the radio pulsar that in interacting with matter, for example, close to the Lagrangian point. So when the matter is ejected and start overflowing uh, the Roche lobe. And basically, as soon as you have the radio pulsar, as still you have the radio pulsar active, basically you can put pressure on this matter, creating some sort of uh, a courting of matter ejected from the system. If that's the case, you can explain why by losing such, such a large amount of matter, you have this fast uh, um, uh, expansion of the orbital period. And in this picture, actually, you can also explain a very peculiar thing that we don't see this system uh, uh, emitting as a radio pulsar. Why this model is good for that? Well, if you have a courting of matter around the system, so covering the pulsar, basically you will create free-free absorption, meaning that all the gigahertz uh, um, signal from the radio pulsar is basically uh, covered or washed by, the, by, the, um, by this uh, matter. Of course, there are other interpretations. We don't have much time now to, to uh, go through, through that, but this is, I mean, I would like to uh, show you this one because it's a very promising one. Uh, actually, I can stop here and maybe I can quickly show you the results from uh, the latest uh, source that I discussed. So the, 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 the one that directly showed the, the expansion of, uh, of the system. So this is the only eclipsing uh, uh, accretive millisecond X-ray pulsar. So not only, not only uh, coherent signal, but also eclipses, meaning that once per orbit, the neutron, the companion star is in between the us, the line of sight is in the line of sight and covers the system. So you see these effects now in the in the bottom part. So that's a light curve. You see type one bars, and then after a while you have a lack of X-ray photons because the companion is in between. That's of course very interesting because it gives us some limit, some constraints on the inclination of the of the system and this help us constraining the neutron star, the, the, sorry, the mass of the companion star. One thing that I would like to show you is the following. Doesn't, so we, we apply timing uh, uh, analysis. We get uh, uh, the evolution of the, of the phases. One thing that I would like to show you is, is, is the following. So here I'm comparing the properties, orbital properties uh, uh, in 2010, first outburst, and 2021, second outburst. One thing that you can notice is that there is a clear significant difference in two parameters, orbital period and semi-major axis of the binary system, basically the separation of the two objects. It's actually the first time that we directly observe with only two outbars, uh, significant variation of the orbital period. And in absolute, the first time we have a significant deviation, variation of the, of the semi-major axis because we have more sensitivity for this source, most likely due to the inclination. Let me just see, give you a brief overview. The, 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 if you remember the numbers that I show you for 1808, the, the orbit was expanding at a rate of the order of 10 to the minus 12 second per second. This source is basically expanding twice, two order of magnitude faster. So it's 10 to the minus 10, even faster. Of course, if it doesn't work for 1808, so if, if you cannot explain it, predict it by normal uh, uh, transfer of matter from one side to the other, also for this case, doesn't work. And also for this case, basically, we need to lose matter at a rate that is huge. So we need basically to lose all the matter from the system and we need to transfer it at a rate of the order of Eddington limit, actually two order of magnitude larger than Eddington read limit and lose it very far from the, from the companion star. So basically this is telling you that the, the possible explanation on orbital expansion due to mass transfer from one side to the other doesn't apply very much. And also it's very really weird that the orbital separation is varying that fast. I go very quickly. 
if you take that uh, Kepler's third law and you uh, uh, derive this in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, as a function of time, we can actually put together how quickly is varying the orbital separation, how quickly is varying the orbital period in terms of how much mass you, can, you need to transfer to explain those things. Basically, basically, it turns out that there is a discrepancy of order of magnitude between what we predict and what we expect. And there is a nice possibility here is that most likely what we are seeing here is not a common binary system, but it can be an hierarchical triple system. So there is another object that we cannot see that basically is affecting, is modifying significantly the, the, the properties of the system, such as orbital period and, uh, uh, and the separation, but with only two points at the moment. So with only two outbursts, it's basically impossible to try to infer uh, uh, well, the properties of a triple system. So we need to wait, hopefully, for more outbursts coming in the next year to try to figure out what's going on here. So, uh, well, I, I, I leave it with some open questions on the fitting is a compulsor, but I'll stop here because I took you much more time than expected. So I apologize for that. Andrea, thanks a lot for this very nice talk. Uh, so I'm sure there must be some questions from audience. We have time for that. If there is any question, we can take. I don't is see there... the chat. I, I see people, I, uh, I see some messages, but I don't. Ah, yeah. Ünal Hocam, buyurun. Uh... Andrea, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, I do. Okay, okay. my question is about the quies uh, quiescent stage of uh, accreting millisecond pulsars. Uh, and to my knowledge, except three transitional millisecond pulsars, uh, no pulsations were observed, detected, uh, in the quiescent stages of these accreting millisecond pulsars. Uh, my question is, for how many sources can you say that the lack of pulsations is due to lack of accretion onto the star? This is first question. Okay, so do you have a second one or I reply to uh, this one? Yes, I have second one, again related okay, I, to, yeah. Okay. I reply to this. Okay, so first of all, the lack of pulsations in quiescence, uh, of course, is related with no accretion. So we don't expect accretion to be, to be there. And the lack of pulsation that I'm discussing is not really on x-rays, it's in radio, right? So x-ray pulsations is only when you accrete matter. When matter stops, so in quiescence, you expect them, as the transitional okay. do, to show radio pulsations yeah so sorry my so, question is related to x-ray pulsations yeah so x-ray pulsation is not expected in uh, quiescence because you don't have you don't have accretion on the surface so basically what happens once you stop the accretion basically the hot spot where the extra photons are coming the, the extra photon creating x-ray pulsars uh, is coming basically will cool down and the temperature will be relatively homogeneous in, in, uh, in, the, sur in the surface of the neutron star. And therefore, you, you don't have this pulsar effect uh, uh, anymore. Keep in mind that usually the average fraction of X-rays pulsating in those systems are a few percentage. So it's between five to 10%. There are some systems with more. But basically only a small fraction. So meaning that the difference in terms of the region where they are created and also the difference in temperature is relatively small with respect to the, to the, to the rest. So the cooling, as soon as you stop accretion, the cooling of the hotspot is very rapid. So at the end of the outburst, you already don't, you don't have enough sensitivity to spot uh, pulsations. I, uh, I don't know whether I answer your question, hi. Uh, yeah, then I understand. During quiescence, when the X-ray luminosity is low, for most of the sources due to 
insufficient photon statistics, we cannot say for sure that there is no accretion. There could be accretion, uh, but okay. So do you, do you, due to low that, accretion rate, maybe we, we cannot detect this. Is that correct? Okay, so let me say like this. Uh, if, if that's the case, so if you, if you assume there is low accretion, so low M dot during quiescence, what you expect is a disk truncated very far away. If that's the case, it can be that basically not having the disk support anymore, there is no way you can channel matter in the lines. So basically the idea is that is either no matter is accreting and what we see in terms of x-rays is only the cooling of the surface of the neutron star or if you have very low uh, um, uh, mass accretion rate basically accretion is going radially there is no matter intercepted by the line and accreted in the poles that's basically the idea in quiescence i'm more in favor of the first one like you're seeing the cooling phase of the neutron star. Like we don't have signs of accretion disk, or, or if if you have it, they are truncated very far away. Okay, but but uh, my uh, small objection on this: uh, we observe accretion uh, at least for transitional systems at very low accretion rates, at rates of about ten to the thirteen gram per second. So if this well, is yeah. pos possible for these systems, this could also be possible for the others as well. Yeah, well, that, that can be a, a possibility. For example, there is something uh, in between quiescence and standard cases. So usually if you take uh, transitional uh, as a reference, they, they seems to show this uh, subluminous state which has luminosity of the order of 10 to the 34, 10 to the 35, which is not really quiescence. So you can still have a structure, some sort of this structure. And that's the reason why for some of them, you see X-ray uh, pulsations. But when you go to quiescence, so 10 to the 32, I mean, M dot needs to be much lower that the amount you need to support an, an, an accretion disk. So there must be something in between. But if if we talk about quiescence standard quiescence, I'm not sure whether you have evidence of uh, of accretion. It's probably a bit less evident. Okay, thank you. Uh, and second one uh, about the measurements uh, of uh, period derivative in uh, long-term secular spin evolution. Uh, you yes. mentioned this. In this estimation, is it possible to eliminate the effect of the outbursts? Uh, can you say that you measure the spin down only for the quiescent phase? Well, uh, let's see if I can go back to my slide. I, actually, I, I uh, attempt something similar. So if you see this plot here, the Sachs J1808, you basically have the 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 top on the top plot as uh, values of the frequency measure mm -hmm. basically at the end of each outburst, and then you have these uh, uh, colored regions that are basically for each outburst is the contribution of the spin up during to the outburst. So I try to take into account that and say, okay, during the outburst, so the last value of the frequency that I'm measuring during the outburst is actually the effect of a bit of spin up. Hmm. And then I need to subtract this if I want to be coherent with the measurement. Mm -hmm. So in principle, sometimes you can, if there is a clear spin up. In general, unless you don't have spin down as in the case that I show you, we expect that angular momentum will, will, will spin up the system. So it should be taken uh, into account. Shot noise, uh, uh, timing noise is a pain in the ass in that respect, because for most systems, basically it doesn't allow us to have 
a, a let's say a significant uh, measurement of the spin up during the output or spin down, let's say. So variation of the frequency. So in so to answer your question, yes, it can be done. It should be done. I tried to do it for such a 1808, but the difference um, doing that uh, doesn't change much the result. So the, the, the value that I estimated there was basically of the same order of magnitude than the one done by other authors where this, this, this work wasn't done. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're right. Is there any other question? Uh, actually, Andrea, I have a question related to the uh, first question by Yunel Artan. Uh, so while you are mentioning uh, the spectral properties of AMXPs, you said that in the soft state, contonization is not important, but in the hard low state, contonization is important. So for the lack of pulsation, Contonization can also play some role on that. Maybe there is an accretion there in the very low state, but uh, contonization uh, cloud can smear the pulsations out. Okay, uh, there is a good point, but keep in mind that we are uh, dealing with different frequencies. So again, the lack of pulsations is not really lack of X-ray pulsations, it's lack of radio pulsation. Radio pulsations uh, with the with the thickness and the density of the corona that we well the ideas we have for for the corona it shouldn't be such a big problem and also yeah there is another problem now that I'm thinking uh, how do you preserve the corona as we know it uh, in the case of let's say low low mass accretion rate so well it's difficult because we don't have a clear idea of how you you form a corona right but the idea is that at some point probably you are you are taking part of the mass from the from the accretion disk uh, you're making the accretion disk uh, uh, evaporate somehow and you take part of this this mass and you spread it around and you and you keep it probably somehow highly energetic, either with the magnetic field of the neutron star or jets or, you know, things like that. But once you lose support, so once you have low mass accretion rate, I don't know, in my mind, I have the feeling that also the corona somehow will probably shrink. But back to the other point, I think the density, the actual density of the corona that we, uh, that we have now is very effective on uh, interacting with the uh, soft photons because of Compton. It's not really effective. It shouldn't be that effective with uh, with low frequency, with, with high frequencies or low wavelength uh, um, uh, signals such as radio. While on the other end, if you take all the amount of matter that, that we would like to lose in the radio ejection model, in that case, the courting, the, the, the thickness and the distribution of matter will, will be uh, important or, or can be actually. We, uh, at the moment, we don't have uh, uh, an answer to that. And the other point would be, well, if we, if we see the transitional, so if at least we have one case where you can go from a critical millisecond X-ray pulsar to radio pulsar, what is the main difference with respect to the other 20 that we have? So it's not, I mean, you don't have this, this cloud of matter at the end. Well, we have variation of the orbital period as well for the transitional. So it's a tricky question. Okay, thanks a lot, Andrea. So if there is no any other question, we can... Uh finish our talk for today. Andrea, we thank a lot to you uh, for accepting uh, our offer to give the talk here. And it was very nice talk for all of us. So you, yeah, it was a pleasure for me. And actually, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, well, we'll see each other hopefully in conferences around Can I jump in? next. Uh, there's a, I think one question, Ozan. Ah, okay. Okay, we shall take the last question uh, if you have yeah, time, sure. Andrea. Yeah, no problem. Okay, we shall uh, take Ozan Toyran. You can ask your question. Hello, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I mean, if you have time and other people have time, I would like to maybe discuss a bit further. Uh, yeah. So I was thinking about uh, what you said during the question phase during this uh, radio phase, the more mass can be actually ejected from the system. Uh, yeah. So I was thinking in some of the sources, for example, maybe uh, you are familiar with the Glenn Pedakis 2021. They studied three sources there. Uh, uh, IGR 00291 and some other sources. So my point here is that there are really high spin-up uh, talks we see there. We try to model them as well during the spin-up. And, and these talks are really high spin-up talks. So I was thinking maybe this uh, uh, matter that's expelled during the crisis somehow stays in the system and, and maybe comes back and at a later time, maybe at a time scale, a few uh, orbital periods, uh, comes back to the system and maybe somehow adds to this high torques. What would you com comment on that? Uh, now that you mentioned, I probably read the paper, but I, yeah, I don't remember exactly all the details, but I'm the back of my mind when you were describing this, uh, yeah, there are several things that we need to keep in mind. So first of all, at least for uh, for for IGRJ00291 uh, is one of the sources that I showed where actually we have um, we have measurement of the spin down in quiescent. Spin down means uh, that the frequency. So when you start a new outburst, the frequent the rotation frequency is slightly smaller than the one that you had at the end of the previous outburst. Now, if that's the case, basically we can say we are confident that during quiescence phase, there is no spin up apply on the neutron star, right? Yeah. yeah. Because otherwise you would have larger value of the frequency. So during quiescence, in that case, nothing happened. Or you need to find some sort of, let's say, you have possibility of accretion that gives you spin down, as I show you the trading disk. But then you also need a disk. And if you have a full grown disk, you, you observe it in x-rays, right? So the, the fact that we, in, in x-rays, we have very low uh, flux compatible with no disk or very low accretion. And you see spin down basically, it's telling you that at least to my mind, there is, there is no torque applied. Um, so spin up torque applied on the, on the neutron star. Uh, the other thing is that uh, um, uh, for for uh, 0, 0, 2, uh, 2, 9, 1, during the outburst, you see spin up. So when you have matter transfer, you see that the neutron star is spinning up. So in this scenario, it's quite it's a relatively standard. I see matter transfer, it spins it spins up. I don't see I don't transfer matter, it spins down. So probably that system. In this respect, doesn't require extra processes saying, okay, I, I'm ejecting matter and at some point I need to create this one. Uh, perhaps for others, uh, it might be that actually if radio ejection is correct, uh, then the, 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 this some sort of cloud, uh, 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 yeah, courting of matter that you are creating very far from the system, at some point will collapse collapse back and probably be the starting point of, uh, of an, uh, a new outburst phase. I'm not sure whether you have enough energy to push it, uh, to, to push it away, although in terms of ex uh, uh, orbital expansion, what I try to show is that in order to reconcile with the speed at which the system is expanding, you need to lose the angular momentum. So that, that matter that you are pushing away doesn't need to be, what well, doesn't have to be bounded gravitational speak into the system. Because if it's bounded, then you need to keep, to keep count also when you, when you balance 
the angular moment. So I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm trying to. What well, I need to read better the paper to try to understand uh, maybe if they give some hints of these extra processes. Uh, but uh, but at the moment I, I cannot see exactly how you can put this matter in that in the kind of uh, scenario. But it might be. I mean, it just you know. He's just thinking out loud for the moment. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, they don't mention this, uh, you know, maybe uh, coming back of the matter. But, uh, I was just speculating from that point, since we have, we observe really high spin-up torques, maybe could that be there? But you explained it really nice. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to you for your question. Okay, thanks. Thanks again to Andrea and to all our audience. So bye for today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.